Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome um, to this Camden Conference uh, community event. Uh, I'll uh, turn everything over to Karen Massey in just a moment to, um, to uh, talk about the Camden Conference and introduce tonight's speaker. But uh, I just wanted to say a few things before we started. First of all, my name is Jeff. My name is also Jeff, Jeff Eastman. I work at uh, the Merrill Library in Yarmouth. Um, everybody's probably uh, had a year of experience using Zoom by now, um, but in case you haven't, um, uh, let's just go over a few things to, uh, so that you know what to expect tonight. First of all, as we were just establishing, uh, you can all see us and hear us, but we can't see you or hear you right now uh, because of the way that this, uh, this version of Zoom is set up. It's not uh, it's not a meeting where we're all equals sitting around a table. This is a webinar. So um, the five of us are panelists here and all of the attendees are, your, your identities are, you know, sort of hidden right now. Um, but, uh, uh, so, so you're all muted. We can't hear you right now. Uh, at the end of uh, the lecture, um, we will uh, open it up for question and answer. And at that point, uh, you'll be able to ask a question out loud if you'd like. Uh, Andrea will unmute you. She's sort of doing the, playing the role of, um, you know, person walking around in the audience with a microphone. She's got experience with that, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, so you can, you can uh, virtually raise your hand with a button uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you prefer not to speak out loud and you want to chat in, uh, but, or type in your question, uh, you can do that with the question and answer uh, uh, button that's down there as well. Um, throughout the lecture, if you have technical questions, Andrea said she would be willing to take those, use the question and answer uh, uh, function there too. She's going to keep an eye on it uh, while Jeff's talking, but um, uh, if you have any questions for uh, Jeff Thaler, save them for the end, please. Uh, we'll go on for about 40 minutes uh, listening to the lecture, and then the question and answer session will probably be 15 or 20 minutes. So I imagine we'll wrap up close to 8, maybe a few minutes after. Uh, we probably won't go until 8.30, but who knows? This could really spark a big conversation. Um, one thing I didn't mention, uh, there, there might be some people who are just phoning in, not using a mobile device, not using a computer. And for those people, if they want to raise their hand, uh, you can do so by pressing star nine. Uh, so at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the lecture, the Q&A session, you can either raise your hand right in the Q&A box or press star nine on your phone. Um, okay, now Karen uh, will introduce Jeff and tell you a little bit about the um, Camden Conference. Hi, my name's Karen Massey. Um, I'm at home in Yarmouth and um, I am on the Camden Conference Community Events Committee and we organize these events at libraries all around the state. Um, we're the southern main portion, so we're, we're sort of, the rest of them are in the mid coast area where Camden is. Um, on February 20th and 21st, we will be hosting our 34th annual Camden Conference. Um, and obviously this year it will be virtual. So it'll be a little bit shorter. It will be held on um, February 20th and 21st. And it's entitled The Geopolitics of the Arctic, A Region in Peril. Uh, it's a live streamed event. And um, if you go to camdenconference.org, you can find out all about this. And um, there are many other events that you might be interested in. And if you go to events on the website, you will find those. Um, so we hope you will check out some other events and we hope some of you will sign up for the conference, which you can do on the website um, and join us on the 20th and the 21st. Uh, the first speaker, the keynote speaker at the conference will be Olafur Grimson, the former president of Iceland, and the uh, moderator will be David Brancaccio. 
Um, so now I would like to introduce Jeff Thaler, who will be doing the presentation tonight. Uh, he's in the same house where I am in Yarmouth, he's my husband. Um, but Jeff is a professor of practice at the University of Maine School of Law and the Associate University Council for the Floating Offshore Wind Projects for the University of Maine system. He's also an associate faculty member at the University of Maine's Climate Change Institute. Uh, Jeff currently teaches at the Law School, Administrative Law, Environmental and Administrative Law Practicum and Energy Law. And in 2020, he created a new course, Environmental and Climate Litigation, that compares trends in the US, China, and Europe. He also is a co-founder of the Arctic Futures Institute, a collaboration of UMaine and Maine Law School, and is co-founder of the Environmental and Energy Technology Council of Maine and the American College of Environmental Lawyers. Jeff, you're on. Thank you very much, Karen. I wanna thank the library staff and all the participants tonight. It's great that you're here and I appreciate that you're here and not in Washington getting ready for the inaugural events tomorrow. But I also appreciate people taking time out of their busy schedules to learn something about uh, both a part of the world that many haven't been to, I had not been to until about a year and a half ago, as well as about Maine. So I I'm, gonna, I'm gonna use three letters, a three letter word that I think is one of the most powerful in the English language, and that's, that's W-H-Y, why. So why should we care about Greenland here in Maine? And I think part of the answer is, and hopefully you'll see as we go along, uh, is well there's a couple answers one is that uh, ironically greenland is a lot like the amazon rainforest in brazil and south america what happens there doesn't stay there deforestation of the amazon and uh, how that affects and is impacted by climate change has a global effect but even more than the deforestation in the amazon or elsewhere what is going on in Greenland is having an effect and will have an ongoing effect here in Maine. But we're really, what's, what's happening in Greenland and how does it compare? So I'm gonna move somewhat quickly through these slides. I will make them available to the library staff afterwards if people want them. You're also free to contact me at the email address on your screen. My name, jeffrey.thaler at maine.edu and here we go. So Karen introduced me already, but as she said, basically, this is my background, although she forgot I did teach nursery school while in law school for whatever that's worth in terms of uh, Greenland. But, and I have been working on floating offshore wind, and, but a variety of issues arising out of renewable energy and climate change. So this is something that I have used for years in all my talks, in my classes, in my lawyering, is really you have to have a sense of where are trends going. Otherwise, what work you're doing, what you're advocating for may not achieve what you want. And you also need to know what's going on around you in the world if you're trying to solve problems. So, here the issue is where are we going with respect to not just climate change in the Arctic, but also really briefly, because I don't have a lot of time, our, our energy use and what's going on in the atmosphere. So this was a graph that was just in the Washington Post last week. And, and you can see how this is thousands of years at the bottom, uh, parts per million change as you go up in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every, uh, these are thousands of years before the present, and you can see the, the straight line pretty much going up here in the last 100 years of how much carbon dioxide we've emitted into the atmosphere, which is what is a greenhouse gas along with methane that is causing the heating that is going on in our world and all the effects that go from there. So I, I wanted to convey again very briefly some comparisons of Greenland I'm going to talk about Greenland and what it is, because it's not a country, Maine, obviously not a country, and, and the United States. So uh, interestingly, all of us, all three of these entities, are more dependent on fossil fuels than not. Uh, the United States even worse than the state of Maine or Greenland. But 
Uh, most of the reason why Maine is is 40% renewables is because of our most a lot of our electricity is based on renewables. But for heating and transportation, we are one of the worst states in the country in terms of our use of fossil fuels. Greenland has um, all of its renewables. I don't know why they said nuclear in the statistic, but it's all hydro. Um, and I'll show you a little more on that in a moment. But um, we're all over dependent on fossil fuels. So where is this? This is called Narsasuk. You can see at the bottom right here. What's interesting, this is where I was in, in this was June of 2019, literally, I think it was the summer solstice when we arrived. And what's a little hard to see here, this is a small village, but there is this line here, this gray line, um, and then, and then all the facilities here was a US Air Force base. And this is part of a, a small fjord that goes through here. During World War II, the US built several Air Force bases in Greenland because of concern about where Germany was going and, um, and then later Russia. But um, this, this is why they have a huge runway here. And, and the other interesting thing that I didn't realize, if you wanna to fly to Greenland from Boston, you can't directly. You have to go to Iceland, which it turns out, which my geography was a little off, Iceland is east of Greenland. So you fly over Greenland, go to Iceland, get on a flight, separate flight, and then fly back two hours to get to Greenland. Um, this is Greenland. So this was a, a picture I took of a glacier, but you can also see all the rock and, and so, and you can see the little icebergs here. And this is what you see a lot in Greenland. It's beautiful and all that, but there's a lot of melting ice. This is another great scene. This gives you a feel for their, I'll call it their architecture, their traditional style, um, very colorful, relatively small. This is actually a decent sized city, but I want you to keep this image of the mountain here in mind. So I'm gonna come back to it a little later because there are, are significant plans for something to be done on that mountain that, is, that will not encourage tourism. Um, here, I just wanted to show you sort of a map and a global perspective of Greenland. This is over toward the left corner, left on my screen. You start getting toward, this is Canada and up in the Atlantic uh, provinces, way over to the left. But you can see how much and this picture to the left of Greenland is covered in ice. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a moment. To the right, again, you can see a map and you can see how few cities there are. They're basically on the West Coast, primarily the Southwest Coast, and where there's just a couple over on the East Coast. And everything else is largely uninhabited and is, is largely ice. And this is a, a national park up in a good chunk of it. Um, down here in the lower left is called Nuuk, N-U-U-K, that's its capital. And then you see Iceland over here, very tiny over to the right. Um, so let's start talking Greenland and Maine. Maine, you know, you can see what our square miles is here, just over 35,000. Greenland is more than 20 times our size, and yet our density is, you know, what would that be, over 400 times the people per square mile, which is understandable, although we have a lot of empty space, largely empty space of people in Maine as well. Just to compare the size of Greenland, Alaska, you'd have to add Alaska and Texas together to get roughly the size of Greenland. So it, it's big. And out of that 836,000 square miles, 660,000 is ice. So that's a significant part of Greenland. And so more of Greenland if you took Alaska and buried it under ice, you still wouldn't have as much ice as you have in Greenland. And you can see Alaska itself has actually relatively little ice. The Greenland coastlines over 27,000 miles, that's fourth in the world to those countries. And you can see Maine, if you crow flies, not that much, but we do have a lot of our uh, inlets, 3,500 miles up and down. So Greenland has a significant coastline, which again is relevant as the uh, glaciers melt. So what simple is, look at the population, the total population of Greenland, that huge, uh, I wanna say country almost, uh, area, only 56,000 people. 
Nook is 18,000, about a third of the population of, of Greenland. And I was interested, I knew New Portland was 66,000, but the metro area of what they call the statistical area is about 538. So not a little over a third of what, um, of what Maine is. So Nook is substantial and there aren't that many other people elsewhere in Greenland. So Greenland, I've been saying it's not a country, it's part of Denmark, the kingdom of Denmark. It has limited self-government. And again, I knew really nothing about this until I researched it before going. It's still largely dependent on Denmark financially, but there are still people who are talking about breaking away from Denmark to be independent. But they haven't voted that yet. They do, as you see, have some self-government and they have some sovereignty rights based on a 2009 Danish law and they can control their education, health, fisheries, environment, and climate, not international affairs or defense. And so they do have the chance to become an independent state. These are the areas still under Danish jurisdiction, uh, which are substantial, and which, uh, again, makes Greenland somewhat different from many other parts of the world, particularly one that people hear about a lot. So what do Greenlanders think about climate change? There was a survey, two surveys actually, this one that I'm referencing here, as you can see, almost 80% of the people said they'd experienced the effect of climate change firsthand, which is a significant number, although only half felt it was detrimental and nine thought it actually would improve their living conditions. And, and we'll talk about that a little more, like how, why would they think that it would improve their conditions? And, and you can see again, a substantial number want more investment in, in clean energy and renewables. Uh, a smaller percentage want regulation of greenhouse gases. So there is some, a little bit of uh, tension there. And um, you know, it's, again, it's certainly not unanimous. So think, remember the 79 or so percent, roughly the 60, 70 percent. This was during the uh, summer that I was there, coincidentally, they had a heat wave. And it was, I mean, it was getting in the 50s, close to 60 when I was there at the summer solstice. The water is quite cold, but the air wasn't too bad. And you can see again, compared to the U.S., the double, double the percentage of Greenlanders say they've personally experienced the effects of climate change, um, which is interesting given, um, again, it's a relatively small number for Americans. So uh, there's a lot of other polling that I've seen and I know. So the majority of Americans will say that there is climate change. A majority of Americans will now say it is human cause, but a minority will say that they've been impacted by it or, or have personally felt the changes. Um, and, and in Greenland, they're worried about different aspects of climate change and the most being the unpredictable weather and we'll talk about in a moment what that means, the loss and thinning of sea ice. Melting permafrost was a significant, particularly in Siberia and other places because when permafrost melts, it releases carbon, carbon dioxide, uh, et cetera. And you can see melting glaciers was actually relatively you know, number five for them. Whereas it, when we think of Greenland in most parts of the world, people are thinking about the glaciers melting. So their perspective is a little different. Um, and, and what's the one that they think you know, is the biggest issue for them is the impact on sled dogs. So you can see how, what they value and what, what they notice. And um, also significant for them when you get to roughly the 48 to 50% range is the harm to people and to future generations, but still slightly less than 50% but sled dogs, you get to two thirds. So this was a week before I got there. Greenland was 40 degrees Fahrenheit, hotter than normal for the whole week. And you can see the deep red was almost the whole uh, area of Greenland was way hotter than it should be, same with Iceland. This very Southern tip was where it was cooler. And interestingly, again, the, the similarity between Maine and Greenland in part from climate change is that the closer you get to the poles, whether it's the South Pole or the North Pole, is where these are the parts of the globe that feel the impact of global warming the most. 
because that's where the globe is tipping closer to the sun at certain times of the year. And it's also where you've got both the Arctic and the Antarctic, which are currently melting and, and to some degree cleaving off some of the large chunks of ice and a glacier, both in Antarctica and the Arctic. Um, I'm sorry for all the text here, but I wanted to just highlight uh, one or two things because we're, we're moving to the coast now. So again, most of the, the glaciers in Greenland have retreated just as they have in parts of the US and Glacier National Park up in Alaska as well. But again, 80% of Greenland has an ice sheet uh, about two miles thick at its thickest point. And, and you can see this is a NASA scientist saying how it's the, the whole coastal environment is, is undergoing a major change and that as the ice sheet retreats, what you're seeing are new sections of the ocean and fjords. And, and that creates more fresh water flowing into the salt water of the ocean, which has, you would think, well, that's not a big deal, but it actually is in terms of not just sea level, but also the flow, the Gulf of um, Mexico flow and, and others that have warmed England and that part of uh, Europe moving up off the Atlantic coast are, and the sub the sublevel current in the ocean is impacted by fresh water going into salt water. So it's reshaping the coastline, but how is it doing it? So you're losing ice. You can see how much ice, how many billions of tons were lost just in 2019 and, and what that would compare to six Olympic pools every second. And uh, interestingly, people talk a lot about the Arctic or the Antarctic melting, but it's Greenland that is the biggest source of sea level rise for us in Maine and for everybody else who has a coastline in the world, 40% of the total. And, and the dramatic point, of course, is that if the whole ice sheet melted, 23 feet of sea level rise, which would be devastating. But I mentioned the impact on the North Atlantic, what they call circulation. That's that current that keeps it warmer than Europe, warmer than it should. And that if you add more and more fresh water, the model suggests that that could be shut off or impaired. So suddenly Europe gets a lot colder, five to 10 degrees centigrade is quite a bit. But so I mentioned they're losing ice, but they're gaining elevation. So how does that happen? You would think that just like in Maine with sea level rise or Bangladesh or other countries where you have floods, you're losing land to the ocean, Greenland ironically is gaining it. And it's partly because the ice sheet has weighed down the land for thousands of years and the land is actually rising back up, very you know, tiny amount, but it is. And there's also this isostatic rebound where the coastline pulls up out of the water and the, um, as you can see here in the second paragraph, there's this uh, gravitational tug that ice does and the less ice you have the less tug there is and so Greenland's coastline is actually rising not going down so when people say well maybe there's an advantage to Greenland that's part of it there are a couple other advantages but also disadvantages but for the rest of the world when I said at the beginning what happens in Greenland doesn't stay there their their land may go up um, everybody else's will be going further underwater. Um, like in Maine, fishing is important, but it's hugely important in Greenland. 90% of their export income from fishing. So they're now seeing what we're seeing in Maine. Maine is starting to see species that we have not seen before and that are moving up. And we're starting to see species that we have traditionally had in Maine, like cod, like lobster, moving, starting to move further north. And Greenland is so now their cod stocks are getting bigger, uh, where, and, but their shrimp is starting to move further north. As you know, we haven't had a, a shrimp harvest in Maine for I think four years now. Mackerel is becoming big in Greenland, which wasn't there before. And their, their fishing season is extending. So they're actually catching more fish than they had been, but it's different fish from what they had before. So to some degree, their fishing is, is okay, is surviving, but the fishermen are concerned because the species are, are definitely changing. 
shrimp fishing may be gone as it is in Maine, and, and there's not a way to, to replace it. And so they're seeing a collapse of that part of, of Greenland's economy. Um, on the ice, remember our sled dogs. So the ice fishing, they used to do a lot of ice fishing. They can't really do that now. Uh, and the season is substantially shorter. You can see it's gone. Um, you know, they've lost a couple months on each end. And so sometimes there is no ice fishing at all. And it's dangerous when they can't get out on the ice and try to use the dinghies. And there are polar bear hunters. There are polar bears there up in Northwest Greenland and they too have had problems. And, and to the extent the polar bears uh, migrate down towards Southern Greenland, they are the ones who are finding it harder to find food and are, are getting thinner and, and starving. As you can see here in this slide, they said the hunters say they can't even store their meat on the ice because um, the polar bears steal it instead of what it used to be. And it's hard to reach the hunting grounds with sled dogs because of the thinning ice. So, and seal hunting has also crashed uh, for the, the natives of Greenland. And the majority of Greenlanders are, are indigenous, are Greenland natives. And so they depend on wildlife and, and fishing and it, it's severely impacting them. Um, there are agricultural impacts as there are in Maine. And, and we know in Maine that with climate change, extreme weather events happen more and more. Um, we've had droughts here. We've had heavy rainstorms. The same is happening in Greenland. Um, even though they're getting less rainfall overall and they're getting drought, they still have some storms as well. But you can see that their lambs are smaller and so they have to import more for their meat. Grass harvest has been reduced and, and almost in half in parts of Greenland. So that's a significant issue when you're in a country like that that's pretty isolated and you have to import what you can't grow and sustain yourself. And in Maine, you know, we've been adapting some of our crops as well based on the climate. We're not feeling the effect quite as much as, as they are there. Um, I wanted to just show you this. This was actually a graphic in the Press Herald a few years ago. So I've talked about the Arctic melting and you can see on this map uh, a better sense of where things are located at the top of the pole, so to speak. And what's important about this is that this is setting off a geopolitical, uh, I'll call it uh, a power struggle, arm wrestling, whatever you want to call it. But every country that nominally or even not, China being one of them, uh, ha touches or claims to touch the Arctic, wants a piece of this ocean and what's underneath it. And Greenland is very much in the center of that. And part of the reason we have an Icelandic shipping company in Maine, in Portland now, I, I'm Skip, is this sense of Maine being a, a, the first port closest to Europe and also closest to the north and that there have been ships that have started going through these old traditional passages. And, and you can save a lot of time and money if you're able to ship across the pole rather than going around uh, some of the continents. So there's a lot of people eyeing that and, and Greenland is sort of right in the middle there. And this is another, um, this is from Imskip's website actually. You can see this dot to the left is Portland and then you can see how they are sort of suggesting where their, their shipping lanes and market are and how much of it from Portland being the point of entry and departure in the United States for Imskip, which is growing significantly, accesses really all of Northern Europe and even over here to Portugal. Um, now, but what's also going on in the Arctic is uh, has to do with, I've talked about fossil fuels. And I said how it's the region of the world most changed and being changed by climate change. Um, but it's also 22% of the world's undiscovered fossil fuels are underneath the Arctic Ocean. So why are all those countries getting ready to fight over who controls what part of the Arctic? It has to do also with minerals and uh, oil and gas reserves, which unfortunately are fossil fuels, which are trying to reduce, not increase. But this is a map that shows you where 
the oil and gas uh, reserves are that are still to be tapped. And you can see how many of them, some of them off of Alaska, but near Canada, Greenland, and then also a lot in Russia and this area. So this is what's going on up in the, the Arctic Ocean area. And I, I mentioned this to you earlier and asked you to remember it. And I said, here's this beautiful mountain, this great village here, looking out at it. And you think, so what's the best way for a place like Greenland to maximize the value of this? And you would think tourism, and tourism is significant there. Just like if we had this in Maine, we would definitely be thinking about tourism. But what is up near the top of this mountain, this is the name of it, one of the largest known deposits of rare earths in the world. And as we're learning, all of us with cell phones, computers, and everything else, is that we need rare earth minerals um, for all of our technology that we are increasingly dependent on in the world, computers and otherwise. And you can see the names of some of them here. Uh, and to electronic appliances, self-driving cars, et cetera. And this mountain has a significant amount of it. And there is an Australian-Chinese um, partnership that is seeking to mine that. And there's also uranium in that site. So as you can see here, this is just talking about rare earth uh, minerals and what they do and how essential they are. Uh, it would require a $1.2 billion investment. This was very controversial when we were there. The government is generally supportive of it for the jobs. So this is a classic debate like we've seen in Maine of jobs versus environment and culture. Many of the uh, indigenous people are against it, but others are for it because fishing is declining, tourism has been slow, and, and they see this as a way of getting some steady jobs for a while. Uh, and the partnership has received most of its permits. There's one or two more that they are uh, pursuing, but it could be approved sometime this year. So now we switch to Maine, and in my remaining minutes, uh, this was a, a youth protest at City Hall there in Portland. So are we the way life will be, not just the way life is or should be? And let's see what's going on in Maine and think about what I just talked about in Greenland. So our temperature has increased. Our, our extreme heat days are expected to go up. Uh, I was mentioning this uh, recently, you know, we complain about the cold weather during the winter, but it, I remember really 30 years ago or so that when we had cold nights, I was using a hairdryer to try to keep my pipes from freezing in, in my uh, bathrooms when I was living in Falmouth. And so we get very few sub-zero days on the coast anymore. And, and certainly the average temperature has been going up. But we are getting and seeing increased ocean temperatures, although it doesn't feel like it in the summer, but it is on average rising sea levels, et cetera, more frequent storms. And we also have this is public health maladies. Now this is from this link, which is, as, you, as many of you know, uh, Governor Mills and the legislature created something called a, a climate council. And the Climate Council met for the past year. I was part of one of the working groups, the energy group, and came up with ultimately a, by the end of the year an, a, a report and recommendations and action plan. And there will be bills in the legislature this session about trying to implement the plan. So this is coming from this report, this in the next slide or two. So we've had some ocean heat waves. The Gulf of Maine um, is the second fastest warming body of water in the world. The first is off of Japan. And you can see that it's losing its historic properties and that there are species disappearing from it, as I mentioned. Um, but we also we talk about warming a lot. People don't think about acidity, but the ocean acidity levels are rising. And that has a significant impact on Maine because we've developed an aquaculture industry here with oysters and other shellfish. We think of lobsters, same thing. Uh, scallops and, and sea urchins. And if the, the more acidic the water is, the harder those critters have to survive. And, and there's a significant increase, as you can see, and it, it's only accelerating. So what's going on on land? Our winters are shorter, summers are longer by two weeks on average. 
and and that's changing the the crops that we can grow but it also has a, a role in as we know more about lyme disease and and tick-borne diseases that's significantly increasing and that's a direct result again from the warmer shorter winters and while we've been lucky in Maine with our forests of not being attacked as badly as out in the Colorado Rockies or the Canadian Rockies by uh, pests that can destroy whole forests, that, that's a risk that we have in this state, given 89% of the state is covered by forest. This is from um, another, the University of Maine does a climate report every few years. This is taken from that. And you can see, I just wanted to show you how it changes. You know, while Northern Maine, the annual temperature increase has been about 3.1%, slightly more on the coast. Again, not a surprise, but this is all relative. So it's accelerating faster on the coast. And you can see in the winter what the changes are as well. And as I said, we're getting less opportunity for cold activities, ice and frost, snowmaking which hurts our ski industry and uh, snowmobile industry. Increased days of mud, that's not helpful, but you know, is what it is. And thaw, and, but on also, also insect pest survival. Um, our precipitation has gone up and so have our extreme events. So when we get rain, sometimes we get these major events, which causes more stormwater runoff, which causes problems on the coast. You also start seeing more algae blooms because the water in the lakes warms more than it, it historically has and you don't get as much flow. Um, and as you can see here in Northern New England, the temperature of lakes has generally gone up almost a degree and a half per decade faster than the world average. Um, so that's why people like to go to the lakes, but again, it's, it's threatening the health of the lakes and the ecosystems. And, and fewer, the less snow we get in the winter, then we have less snowpack. This all impacts our groundwater supply. A majority of Mainers depend on, households depend on groundwater for their water source. And this is where, again, we've had droughts in the last few years. I know there were people on Peaks Island who didn't have water in their wells. And this was, I've, I've used this uh, graph for a while just for ice out. We talked about ice fishing in Greenland, you know, Maine has had historically a lot of ice fishing, but ice out is happening uh, earlier and earlier. And you can see this is Damariscotta Lake and Sebago Lake that the dates are getting earlier and earlier of when the ice is melting versus when you go inland. And this is from a report by Maine Audubon Society that if we continue at sort of the rate of warming that the world has been going in, without significant reversal of our, our greenhouse gas emissions. So you're looking at over, since the uh, industrial revolution, a five degree or so increase by 2050, possibly more by 2100. Now that sounds extreme, but we're already at about two degrees Fahrenheit increase by 2050. And, and remember what I showed you about Maine itself back up uh, where it was roughly three degrees in some parts of Maine. We get more hot days when it feels like 90, et cetera. Snowpack reduced by 50%, that's significant. Gulf of Maine will be warmer. Sea level rises of a foot, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it leads to 10 times more flooding in Portland. Um, and, and that's significant and, and will cause damage. And so again, we get the stormwater transport, we get more pollution going into Casco Bay and other bays, Penobscot Bay, and into our lakes. And so water quality decreases, property values decrease, and you start getting a domino effect of which, which causes economic damage because you have not only reduced property taxes, but also um, not everybody is insured for some of the damages from floods or otherwise that happen. So um, just a few more slides on Maine before we go to Q&A. Again, sea level rise has been happening on the coast and it's been accelerating. And as Maine Audubon had said, these are again predictions of roughly how much it will rise by 2050. This one again is from the climate action plan of the state. And they're estimating really more than a foot by 2050. 
and, and they're calling that a 15-fold increase in what they call nuisance flooding, which um, has already been happening in Portland. We remember some of the floods down on Marginal Way and down on Commercial Street. And ultimately, that impacts water supplies and groundwater aquifers, also impacts our beaches, dunes, salt marshes, coastal wetlands. And, but um, for those of us who like to go to the beach, this last part in the second paragraph, just that projected rise by 2050, which is only 30 years off, we may lose 40% or more of our dry beach. And, and it could happen sooner. So um, that would be a significant impact on our tourist economy at real estate values, as well as our own personal pleasure. So this was just a, a slide I put together for myself for a course a couple of years ago. Just from sea level rise, you think about it, our property boundaries have historically been based on the historic levels of the coast, if you're on the coast. What happens when you start losing beachfront? What happens when you start having water moving further and further inland? All the issues of public access to the intertidal zone for fishing, following, and navigation, all of a sudden that zone changes. People's access to the coast changes. Flood insurance, there was a risk a few years ago that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, was going to change Maine's map so that many people would not be able to get insurance who lived on the coast. While that, there was such an uproar that they backed off, we could start seeing that come back again. Um, you have to get a lease from the state if you want to put a boat dock or something somewhat permanent into the submerged lands of Maine, which is owned by the state. So what are submerged lands? The definition of that will, is, is defined in law, but as more and more of the coast is underwater, there'll be more submerged land and less privately owned potentially. Um, also in terms of coastal wetlands and sand dunes, shoreland zoning, again, will have to be changed. And certainly an increase in insurance claims and disputes. Um, I already mentioned acidity I should have been taken out. I mentioned, so on land, um, about 90% of us in Maine, 90% I mean, of Maine is covered by forest uh, and they sequester much of our carbon emissions. But again, the industry is expected to having, have more problems as you get more forest pests. We had the spruce budworm years ago, but they're expecting more of the problems that have been having out west because of the, the, the fact that these pests can survive in the winter. And again, this is from Maine Audubon. These are, this is a list of birds that are, they, they feel will be threatened by climate change and related threats, so it's substantial. Um, and most of the national environmental groups now will tell you that the biggest threat to wildlife generally uh, is climate change. So are there benefits? I talked about some of the benefits for Greenland. And yes, the state report does talk about some economic opportunities, trying to, we have more uh, wind and solar potential than a lot of New England with wood, which is 90% of, or 89% of the state, we could do more with biofuels. Um, and we could try to reduce our fossil fuel consumption. Maine right now, depending on the price of oil, and gas, but largely oil exports. So out of everybody's pocket, about five to six billion dollars a year just spent on fossil fuels. We're the most reliant state in the country on heating oil. We drive a lot. And that's about four thousand dollars for every person who's on this call that if you could keep in Maine would, would go into your pocket, as well as create uh, more jobs for people to stay here. Um, other economic opportunities, you know, for shipping, our ports, East Port, Sears Port, Portland might get some advantages. And, and again, we could try to be more of a leader in clean energy and, and investment there. So there's some potential, but there, there's certainly more and greater economic harm risks as well. And so again, this is the map I showed you before as to why we're strategically positioned if this is the trend that's happening in the Arctic, and, and it is. So a couple last takeaways before Q&A. Um, we have a lot in common. We're vacation land. They're, they're also hoping to get more tourism. We're both impacted by COVID. They've had no deaths in Greenland, only 30 cases 
at all of COVID, but that's because they basically shut down who could come in to Greenland, which means they don't have a, a tourist business for this summer and didn't last summer. We're also dependent on fisheries, both of us, they more than us. We both deal with jobs versus environment issues. So then with the mine, we have a mining proposal up in Northern Maine, but um, anything proposed along the coast of Maine often has that issue. Um, and so, as I said earlier, what, what happens in places like Greenland, Brazil, Indonesia, doesn't stay there, which, which leads to my last couple slides is, so I showed you the statistics on people who say, yeah, climate change exists, but I haven't been impacted by it in the US, half of the number in Greenland. So why is it that people think they haven't been impacted? And that Socrates on the right reaching for the hemlock, I, I use that because for some reason, people just, their brains are not wired to too many, uh, in my view, too many people can't grasp the threat that climate change poses. And it's, it's, this is not my quote, it's from somewhere else, but why is this, why does that happen? And it's the way, and there are books on this, but you can't see climate change. It's, it's slow moving in a way. You have short-term costs against uh, what's gonna accelerate. As they say, no pressing deadlines, so people push it to the future. Um, complex, unfamiliar, slow moving, intergenerational, no enemy. And, and um, I can talk about this all some other time, but it, there's some interesting comparisons with how people have responded to the pandemic. And again, you don't see the virus, people are asymptomatic, and, but still may have uh, caused problems. But part of the reason more people have gotten to wearing masks and whatever is they do know or see people who die. Whereas with climate change, you're not seeing it at all that immediately. So. These are two books, uh, this one on the left, George Marshall. Uh, you can see the title, it sort of talks about this mental issue. I like the book on the right, I used to buy it for my students. It, page by page, just things we buy in the grocery store, things we do in our daily lives, it, it gives you the carbon footprint for everything like that. So it's a nice little tool to remind ourselves that even when we talk global issues, a lot of it comes down to local as well. And last, uh, this was a book I read when I came back from Greenland. It's, it's a great read, and Karen read it as well. You'll be amazed at the bravery and courage, if not stupidity, of a lot of explorers of the early part of the 20th century into Greenland. Um, that Greenland was viewed like the moon back then, and that, that the great explorers of the world all felt that this was the last place in the world that, that to, to go and really stake their, their name for history. So John Gertner is the, the author and uh, a really good read. And these were, again, a couple links to articles I've written on some of these issues over time. And with that, I, I will um, end the slideshow and turn it back over to our moderators. All Thank right. you all very much. Thank you, Jeff and um, Andrea here. I just wanted to open up uh, for questions. If anybody has a question, you can go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, there should be a, a dial a button at the bottom of your screen where you can click raise hand. I know a couple of you have played around with that a little bit, um, or you can type a question into the question and answer box. Oh, and we've got a question from an attendee. Uh, Anne asks, will you post the links to your articles again? And Anne, um, we can absolutely send those links out to the attendees. Yeah, and I'll provide the slides if you wanna send those as well, which we'll have a minute. Okay, so Courtney Collins has a question. Courtney, I'm gonna go ahead and open this up so you can talk. You mentioned one of the advantages of a warming climate was a prolonged possible cruise ship season. Um, here in the mid coast, we have a lot of questions about cruise ships. And it's one of those things where the local residents versus the greater economy are in conflict. Um, what are your views on that? I mean, do we really want to prolong the cruise ship season? <laughs> No, well, um, personally, I would like not to prolong the cruise ship season because that means that um, 
you know, we're losing the Arctic, but yeah, it's um, no, I agree. I mean, what's interesting is that again, Portland, the port of Portland has had in the last 15 years, I used to have an office down near the waterfront, a significant explosion in the number of cruise yeah. ships. And interestingly, most of them come in the fall, not during uh -huh. the summer. And, and we know that Bar Harbor has also gotten a fair amount of cruise ships as well. So I think it, it really is um, something where, you know, the pandemic has certainly had that, uh, has slowed that down. But I think once we, once ultimately that is overcome, I hear you on that. This is sort of this so-called, well, I don't want to call it so-called, jobs versus environment. I've been involved in a number of those debates. And there are some people who want the business. They want those people coming off the ships and buying their artwork and going to the restaurants and going on tours of the breweries and mm -hmm. there are others who don't so those are tough issues that are that have to be resolved both locally and probably at the state level too mm -hmm. and do you think people in greenland really want increased tourism that's a good question <laughs> and that's a debate worldwide in a lot of places so interestingly sure. I can answer that with a slight sidestep. So I just read an article yesterday about Iceland. And Iceland is, as you all may know, is more accessible than Greenland because you can fly direct on Iceland Air from Boston to Iceland in four hours. And that's been marketed very heavily. And, and Iceland Air, you know, encourages people to stay over so that um, they'll, they'll spend money in Iceland because Icelander also owns some of the big hotels in Reykjavik. But Iceland, natives in Iceland now feel that one thing that they've learned from the pandemic is that they were getting overrun with tourists. They felt they were getting overrun with tourists and that they would like to see when things go, quote, back to normal, a reduction in both the volume and, and maybe more control over the quality of tourism that happens. I've also read the same thing for New Zealand and mm -hmm. for a few other places like that, that suddenly real, and Hawaii was another one mm -hmm. where locals in Hawaii were saying, you know, we sort of like it when it's quiet. We like, we like to be able to get around to our beaches or our other places. And maybe this big tourist boom wasn't so great after all. So I think you're gonna see some of that discussion going on in the next few years. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. And now we have a question coming in from Schuler Grant. Hi, it's Linda, uh, Linda Schuyler. Um, I wanted to ask you, Jeff, how you feel. We're all hopeful after tomorrow's inauguration of a new president that we have a climate control back in sight. And I was wondering if you could comment on uh, Biden's choice for climate control and do you think we will have some influence in the coming years with that? So that's an excellent question, um, and and time will tell. I've been, I will say, from that perspective, my perspective on climate change, that I've been encouraged by the quality and experience of the people who have been named for some of the posts: environmental, energy, and climate. Um, John Kerry is one of them, and you know, um, I would say that Senator Kerry being a politician and he was former secretary of state, certainly cares about the issue. I look more at the technical people, those who have either science or other backgrounds who are being nominated or named for positions as well. And so I do think that we're gonna see a significant shift in our role, both globally in terms of the Paris Treaty, as well as some other, some other areas with respect to climate. I think the challenge is going to be for the incoming president, the split Senate again, and the fact that there are some Democrats, a number of Democrats who are from fossil fuel states. And yeah. so there's already discussion about that is how much of what the president and his team would like to do, can he get through Congress? Mm -hmm. And so that, that will be there are a lot of things that he can do and, and their team can do apart from 
legal action in terms of the agencies, in terms of funding priorities, in terms of international work, but, but in terms uh, and, and trying to undo some of what the previous administration had done through the agencies, just like the Trump administration tried to undo what the Obama administration did. But ultimately, um, so I am encouraged, but my bottom line is that government works slowly. Uh, even in the state of Maine, and that climate change doesn't work slowly and doesn't slow down, and that um, climate change is accelerating at a rate faster than we are getting off fossil fuels. So that, that to me, is the major challenge. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, Andrea. There we go. <laughs> I just wanted to know, uh, thank you for that question. And, and in the chat box, we did have Helena say it was very informative and wanted to thank you for sharing that and bringing it to the forefront of everyone's thinking. And we have Lee with a question now. Lee, you'll just have to go ahead and unmute yourself so you can talk. Bottom left hand corner. Thinking about that mountain you showed us across from the town where there are unusual metals that we might want minerals. Have we learned anything, do you think, from our previous mining experiences here in the United States that would enable that mining to go forward without the great devastation that we've experienced in West Virginia and Pennsylvania and other mining states? Yeah, that's a good question. So what's interesting about that mountain and this project, and one of the things that took us to Greenland, I went there, the reason I was in Greenland, I actually didn't say this, it was a joint, this was part of the Arctic Futures and Institute initiative. We took about 18 um, faculty from University of Maine, University of Southern Maine, two from Maine Law School, one from Husson. Several of them were of all different disciplines, social scientists, law, uh, glaciologists, people who spend their summers in Greenland working on the ice and were meeting with different people. But the area near where we were and where we were visiting and people we were meeting with, there is a World Heritage Site that was designated there a few years ago. It's sort of po about five different pockets of old settlements. The mine would be right sort of in the middle of this World Heritage area. And one of the concerns, some of the people are more concerned about the uranium because it's, it would be an open pit mine. So to answer your question, while in, in West Virginia, Kentucky, coal mining, strip mining was surface mining as opposed to deep, deep mining. There is a bit of concern in, well, there is concern in Greenland among the, the area people that if they do the open pit version of, of the mining that the, the wind would blow the uranium dust off site and toward where people live, fish, where wildlife is. So um, will they learn? Um, time will tell, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but as part of our global economy, it just shows you how you know, our, our total dependence on technology now in, in terms of electronics how, how much we depend on electronics for everything now, almost not everything, but close. But to have those function, you need these rare earth minerals, which are only not there in any parts of the world. The Congo is another one. I mean, they're in places that are remote and or politically volatile, et cetera, et cetera. And every, these major companies, countries, I'm sorry, like the US and China and others are trying to stockpile rare earth minerals as much as they can. So when people were joking about President Trump saying he wanted to buy Greenland a year or two ago, that was part of the motivation. It'd be great if we could invent something like a reverse drone that would go down into the earth and mine these minerals and totally reinvent the way mining is done. Yeah, I also see in the chat somebody uh, talking about having visited Greenland as a hiker. And I was going to say that I, um, I encourage people to go visit when they get a chance. It is, it is spectacular. It's different. 
um, for sure. Um, the people are very nice, uh, but it's just, it's, it's striking how few people live there. Um, 55,000 in a place bigger than Alaska and Texas combined is pretty mind boggling. I think you're on mute again. Thank you, Lee. Uh, and yes, we have somebody in the chat box, Pam, just saying that um, she visited Greenland as a hiker in 2017 and was struck by how the Danes held it in a macro sense that the Inuits and locals were sort of cut out. Uh, Pam notes that she went to that World Heritage site and was it was so tiny um, that they had to stay in a hostel. There's no infrastructure for tourism and farming is so hard there. Uh, mm -hmm. Pam notes that she left feeling worried for them uh, and that they would be co-opted. The environment is so hostile, it is hard for them to make money farming or fishing. <clears throat> uh, and says signing off, thanks. I think I actually visited that hostel you, you stayed at. There aren't too many right in that area. But um, no, I would agree with you. And it's interesting about the Inuit and the natives because they are a majority of the country, as I said and they do have a, a majority of the seats in Greenland's government. And yet a number of them, while, while the opposition groups to that mine, for example, are largely Inuit, there's a number of other natives who support the project, again, because of the jobs issue, because of the money issue, because they just, you know, they worry about losing the, the next generation because there are no jobs. And that is a classic situation here in Maine you know, where our fishing, uh, fishing industry is wondering, you know, will there be fish there for my sons or daughters and what's their future? And same for some of our other parts of our economy. And we all know, you know, we've all read and heard about and talk about the brain drain and, and that there just aren't good jobs for young people to stay in Maine as, as much as there used to be. Ironically, now that we're getting more and more technologically savvy and we have things like Zoom and otherwise, there are people moving back here because they can work remotely. But again, our, our economy is shifting. We are no longer an industrial state and we used to be a natural resource-based economy, fishing, farming, and agriculture. And you know, paper companies are largely gone in this state. Um, farming is small farms and is sort of hanging in there. And fishing is, is under siege as well. Um, we then had a question from Colleen asking, what are some of the ways you feel we could personally take action to reduce our own footprints now? It's always good to have more information. Yeah, so um, I like that book in terms of, you know, what I mentioned about the banana and carbon footprints. So looking, you can get plenty of information online about footprints. Um, it is no doubt ironic that when they have these global climate change conferences and 15,000, 20,000 people get on planes and fly places, that that is a huge carbon footprint. So flying is certainly one of those that you know, the, the greenhouse gas emissions in this country have gone significantly down in the past year because of the pandemic. Plus people are driving less. I appreciate driving less. I mean, I, it's, it's just sort of, it reminds you that you don't have to be going to the gas station every week. Uh, but I do think it's just, it's also, you know, there are things we can do personally in terms of if, if you, whether it's a heat pump so that you're using electricity more than oil, but also paying attention to politics, paying attention to position candidates take, paying uh, attention to local initiatives. So the cities of Portland and South Portland have hired sustainability staff to try to push uh, initiatives. Bangor just hired one a student of mine to help them. And I think those are, those are issues. And ultimately, thinking about, um, well, I mean, ultimately, of, of paying attention to like bills in the legislature this session you know, in terms of what will get through and what won't get through for some of the initiatives that the report uh, is recommending. And contacting, uh, I'll just say this, uh, because I used to do work with legislators and I just presented to a bunch last week, they get shockingly few letters, emails, or otherwise on a given bill. So if a legislator gets five or 10 emails or phone calls about a bill, that's a lot. 
for most bills. And so that has an influence because you're a constituent and they, they need to listen to you. Otherwise they won't get reelected. Do we have any other questions from the group? Can go and again, my, my contact info will be on the slides. Feel free if people want to follow up after, shoot me an email. Oh. I'm not going anywhere, so. Well, great. Well, thank you so much everyone for attending. Um, this is Jeannie from Falmouth Memorial Library. Um, next week, maybe you'll join us with Genevieve Lemoyne on Tuesday the 26th at seven. She will be discussing melting away, disappearing archeology span in the Arctic. And once again, you can email me that um, if you want that link. And we'll send out a link to the recording and the slides in the next day or so, probably tomorrow. All right, thank you all very much for attending and taking time out of your evening to join us. And thank you guys for your questions as well. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jeff Eastman. Thank you, Jeannie. And good night, all. Good night. And thank you, Andrea. Thank you.